Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man who knows it's very hard to get a table for one at Chuck E. Cheese. He is the captain. I prefer Little Caesar Pizza Hut. His store. His store. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring the Carlson Amber Ale by the exquisite brewers over at Elizabeth Brewing Company. This medium-bodied, tawny-colored ale is brewed with roasted barley and dark crystal malts, creating a nutty, caramel, malty flavor. Garage-grade, four out of five bottle caps. Now, let's give some cheers to our good friends right here, Captain. First up, cheers to Courtney, who I think is in Rockford, Illinois. And also a shout out to Joshua listening on the Stitcher app. And a big we like your jib to Kelly in Tiffin, Iowa. Next up, we have Clooney in Adelaide, Australia. George Clooney. And a big shout out to Carrie in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. Here's a double cheers to Jack and Taylor in Brisbane, Australia. And last but not least, cheers to Shelby in Portland, Maine. Everyone we just mentioned went to TrueCrimeGarage.com and contributed to this week's beer fund, and for that, we thank you. And for all of our old episodes, check us out on the Stitcher app. They are free. And you can also check out our bonus show called Off the Record. That's on Stitcher Premium. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Missing Persons Mystery is a special breed of true crime story. The lack of answers or closure for most of us is enthralling. But even if you fall into a different category and you find disappearance stories unappealing, the case we are discussing will change your mind. This is a missing persons case so perplexing and so unpredictable that thousands around the world have been riveted by the inexplicable disappearance of this young woman. This is a case with far more questions than answers. A story in which no one is even sure when it began. Yet it is a tale rife with clues, intrigue, and evidence. In many missing persons cases we discuss, there is some foreshadowing in the victim's life that something bad is going to happen. Maybe they were going through personal turmoil, or they were in an abusive relationship. Maybe they were making questionable choices, or leading an unsafe lifestyle. Sometimes a person is unhappy, and they choose to run away, or maybe they spiral into addiction or worse. We are going to say this up front. None of this was the case here with this missing person's case. This is True Crime Garage. And this is the case of Jennifer Kessie. Jennifer was born on May 20th, 1981 to loving parents Drew and Joyce Kessie. She, her parents, and her younger brother, Logan, were incredibly close. Jennifer was born in New Jersey, but the family moved to Tampa, Florida when she was a child. As a kid, Jennifer was always very responsible and well-behaved. She got good grades, had a ton of friends, and she got along with her parents. Jennifer truly was a golden child with blonde hair, big bluish-green eyes, 
She grew up to be five foot seven or five foot eight tall, 130 pounds. She graduated high school and moved on to the University of Central Florida, where she majored in finance after switching from pre med. Jennifer worked hard and was serious about her schooling and ambitions. When she graduated in 2003, she had multiple job offers. She accepted a job with CFI Westgate Resorts in Ocoee. This is a massive timeshare company where she had interned while in college. She recently was promoted to manager of process engineering at the age of 24. Right. She was the youngest employee to earn a promotion to management. She was working on streamlining a new mortgage debt system installed by the company. The CFI Westgate owner is David Siegel, a somewhat showy, <laughs> I, I have to laugh at my own words here, a very showy individual. He's well known. He's a multimillionaire who built a house so large, mm-hmm. 90,000 square feet, that it was featured in the documentary, The Queen of Versailles, which if you haven't seen that, it is total like guilty pleasure. Sit down, eat popcorn, drink beer, watch that documentary. Jennifer loved her job and had good friends in the division of the huge company she worked in. She was a creature of habit. Many people would probably describe her as type A. She was the kind of person who left for work at the same time every day, who planned her outfits in advance, who had common sense, and who was not afraid to stand up for herself and speak her mind. Right. Although Jennifer was self-confident, independent, and didn't take crap from anyone, she was also fun. Jennifer had a lot of friends, both from childhood and her sorority and college, all of whom describe her as a wonderful person who was a great and loyal friend and who could be counted on. She was obsessed with the New York Giants and insisted on watching every game. She loved the Dave Matthews Band shopping, and the beach. Jennifer made an amazing mac and cheese and drank beer and loved to dress up and go out at night. But she was always in bed at a decent hour and at work on time the next day. Jen had a tiny tattoo of a shamrock on her left hip. I found this interesting. I have a couple friends like this that have a lot of safety measures that they take, some precautions that they take. Seems like Jennifer was really into that. Yeah, she has been described as very cautious and also aware of her surroundings. She never walked alone at night if she could help it, always locked her car doors and carried pepper spray, which was purchased for her and all of her friends by her father, Drew. Some of this is attributable to her parents, who having been mugged at gunpoint years earlier. They were sure to teach their daughter about safety and awareness. Some of it was because Jennifer was a big fan and watched a lot of Law & Order SVU, which will, if you watch enough of it, will scare the crap out of anybody. Jennifer's mother even says that Jen knew to deliberately crash her car in the event that she was carjacked to set off the airbags and have a chance to escape. She also knew that in the event she was ever placed in the car trunk that most trunks have internal latches or you can kick out the taillights to attract attention. Right. Up until November, 2005, Jennifer lived with her friend and roommate in Metro West. It's a planned community, but her roommate was getting married. So she needed to move on right around Thanksgiving, 2005, 24 year old Jennifer purchased her first home for $207,000. This was a condo in a complex called Mosaic at Millennia right? that was being converted from apartments to condos in the height of the Florida real estate bubble. Yeah, but this area wasn't super great. It was located by a, a mall, a new mall. This is what I call when you have a an area that's trying to be a nicer area and is also kind of surrounded by poopy areas. Oh. That's those nice are real word. estate terms. Yeah, poopy. Yeah, you don't want to live here. It's kind of poopy. 
Half of the complex was still being constructed, and the other half was being converted over from apartments to updated condos. Now, Jennifer's unit, number 2226, was in building 22 on the second of three floors. Logan Kessie described the mosaic at Millennia as a literal construction zone. This complex was located at 3573 Conroy Road and featured multiple buildings fronted on a very large pond and had an even larger wooded area behind the complex. Jennifer's parents helped her pick out the place. It was right across the street, as the captain said, from a fancy new shopping mall called the Mall at Millennia, which featured retail shops and eateries. The newspapers at the time described the mosaic at Millennia as, quote, upscale, gated, and fenced. But it's a fair statement to say that the area was just newly becoming nice and that it bordered on some areas that were not so upscale. Yeah, well, and it's also not gated at the time because there's so much construction going on. There are gates. They are not being closed or used properly, and we'll get into that heavily later right some of the neighboring areas have even been described as sketchy or poopy or poopy <laughs> uh, mosaic of millennia is your typical pastel colored florida stucco buildings with open air hallways leading to the condos this was still a major construction zone just like her brother described and this place was not close to maximum capacity news reports from 2006 indicate that only about 250 of close to 500 units were full, and only one other condo on Jennifer's floor was even occupied. Many of the condos were still being renovated and were empty, and in fact, it came out later that many of the workers that were employed in the construction project were permitted to live or stay for a while in these empty condos while they worked the job. One well-known story is that Jennifer, who had only been living in her new condo for about three months when she vanished, had told friends and family that while she loved her new place, this was a very nice condo, by the way, with a balcony overlooking a pond, granite countertops, and her own laundry room, she did not like the workers. She told people that the workmen cat called at her and whistled when they saw her. For anyone, especially a young woman living alone, this is quite an uncomfortable situation. Her parents, who lived about two hours away, encouraged her to report this behavior to the manager's office, but it does not seem that Jennifer ever did so. Jennifer refused to allow anyone into her condo when she was not home. But when she first moved in, her condo needed some finishing touches like paint and plaster. So she would come home from work on her lunch break, let the workers in, and stand there with the door open to the hallway on the phone with a friend or her parents while the men worked. She always locked up after she left. There seems to be no way to track who all the workers were on site at the time. Some of them were undocumented workers with no papers who were probably doing a lot of work under the table. Right. There were no surveillance cameras in place at the complex just yet. Well, and like you said, some of the workers were permitted to stay in the empty buildings. Correct. But I guarantee you there was other workers that were staying that weren't allowed or people didn't even know that they were staying. Who's to say that this worker staying in a condo or in a unit couldn't have friends over or people that that worker knew? Right. You know, staying for a a weekend or a couple of days. It's just, there's a lot of things going on in this condo complex is what we're trying to point out that there's no real checks and balances of these types of activities and uh, movements. And there was also virtually no security at the armless gate when Jennifer lived at mosaic at millennia, the unfinished work in progress nature of the buildings meant that lots of workers, gardeners, maintenance workers, and so on, were constantly coming and going. No one kept track, and according to the Kesses, when Jennifer disappeared and her story broke all over the news, many of the workers 
seem to just disappear or evaporate. They did not want to be under scrutiny, even if they were not involved in any way in her disappearance. Jennifer had been dating someone for about a year when she disappeared. This was Rob Allen. He's an English soccer player who lived in Fort Lauderdale, almost three hours away. They had met at the Tiki Bar in downtown Orlando in 2005. Rob was eight years older than Jennifer. But the two seemed to be a good match since Jennifer was somewhat mature for her 24 years of age. They spoke multiple times every day, and the two of them alternated trips to stay with each other, taking turns every weekend. Rob figures heavily into this story, into the story of Jennifer's disappearance, since he was the last known person to speak with her. Rob has grown very close with the Kessie family and remains so to this day. Going back to your one point, it's really hard to have undocumented workers because we don't know what kind of criminal history that they have. And so in this case, too, we have the undocumented workers staying in the same complex as the owners. Yeah, and the other thing I want to point out, too, to top all of that off, we have the the false sense of security that some of the optics provides for the condo owners. Right. There's They are sold that this place is gated and secure. I'm here to tell you it's neither. And there seems to be no question of what happened to Jennifer Kessie in January of 2006. Jennifer was abducted. Everyone, including the Orlando Police Department, agrees to this. But the remaining question surrounding her disappearance is who took her? How did they take her? And even when did they take her? All of this is unknown even to this day. Let's go through the timeline of the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie to establish what we know and what we do not know. On Wednesday, January 18th, 2006, Jennifer drove from Orlando to her boyfriend, Rob Allen's, in Fort Lauderdale. This was after work. On Thursday, January 19th, the two of them flew from Fort Lauderdale to St. Croix for some R&R. They stayed in a condo there. This is with family friends of Rob's. Photos of the two show them doing the usual vacation-type things, They're at the pool. They're relaxing in the sunshine. They were scheduled to fly back to Fort Lauderdale on Sunday, but for whatever reason, their flight was canceled. So after some scrambling around, they managed to get a flight to Miami and have a friend pick them up to make the 40-minute drive back to Rob's place. Jennifer got up at 6 a.m. On Monday, And after Rob filled the gas tank, her gas tank, and her black Chevy Malibu for her, she made the three-hour drive north all the way up to Orlando and went straight to work that day. According to Jennifer's work colleagues, she had a normal day at work. She raved about her trip and said she didn't want to leave. Around 6 p.m., she stopped in and said goodnight to her boss. This is John Willman. She got in her car and drove the 12 miles home. Her car's transponder said that she went through the usual toll at 6.15 p.m. that day. Do we know how many miles it is from her boyfriend's house to her house? It's a little over 200 miles. Now, while she was in her car on her way home from work, she did call her parents, Drew and Joyce, to tell them about her trip. She also spoke with her brother, Logan, who was living with their parents at the time. Right. Jennifer had given Logan a set of keys to her condo. He was just 21 at the time, and Jen had given permission for him to stay at her place while she was away. This is with some of his buddies. With Logan at Jennifer's place that weekend was Travis Bourguignon, a longtime family friend of the Kessies, and joining The two of them was a guy named Matt. This is Jennifer's ex-boyfriend. Logan and Matt remained friends despite Matt and Jennifer breaking up. Matt didn't actually stay at Jen's condo. 
He lived in Orlando, so he's very close, only about 30 minutes away. He just hung out there with the other two guys. The family says that Matt took the breakup with Jennifer very hard, and he continued to pursue Jennifer for quite some time. Yeah. It's not clear where things stood in January of 2006, because we know that Jennifer had been dating Rob for, it seems like years or over a year, and rumors are that Matt had moved on to a new girlfriend. Right. On the phone with Jennifer, Logan told Jen that Travis, his buddy, had inadvertently left his work cell phone at her condo, and he needed it for work ASAP. Jennifer agreed to find it at her place, and she was going to FedEx it or UPS it to Travis the next day. The family is unequivocal about this. Jennifer planned to bring Travis's cell phone to her work with her on Tuesday and send it out at that time. Right. Again, Jennifer's family says she was a creature of habit. So they can predict, or they say they can predict what she did next. She arrived at home at the condos at Millennia and parked in her designated spot. This is number 2226, the same as her condo unit. That was very near the bottom of the stairwell that went up to the second floor where her condo was. It's literally a matter of maybe 30 feet to her spot from the stairs. Yeah. It was dark out when she arrived home. She brought in her luggage from her trip, which was later found still packed in her condo. She checked her mail which was also found in her condo at the main office on her way in. It isn't known whether she ate anything. Her parents say that there were no takeout containers in the trash. So perhaps she just ate something from the fridge, which did have food in it and likely changed into her sweats, which she always wore at night when home then got on the phone. Yeah. Jennifer's going to get on the phone, but her, condo had notoriously bad cell phone service according to her parents the phone or her cell phone only really worked and this would be sporadically when she was out on the balcony so when at home jennifer would usually use her landline the orlando police have all of her phone records but have never released or discussed them in fact the Orlando Police Department has been incredibly tight-lipped about this entire case, releasing virtually no information. This has resulted in a major legal dispute. Now, that night, Jen spoke with her best friend from childhood. This is Lauren McCarthy. The two were as close as sisters and shared everything. Lauren told IDs disappeared that Jennifer told her on the phone that she had a great time on her trip but that she and Rob were actually having some trouble, mainly with the distance that they live from one another. The distance between was providing this trouble, and neither one of them wanted to move to correct this. Right. This, of course, anybody... That's a problem. Yeah. yeah. Anybody that's been in a long-distance relationship understands that this is a very common situation. Jennifer may have talked to other friends that night, but we don't know for sure. As said, they've not released the call records. But we do know that Rob told the police and Jen's family that the two of them had a phone conversation on Jen's landline, as they did basically every night. This one was at 9.57 p.m. Jen told Rob that she was in bed when they spoke. The two argued on the phone a bit. It isn't known exactly what they discussed, But Lauren told Greta Van Cistern that Jen was, quote, feeling the distance, end quote. Rob and Jen wanted to be together, but neither was willing to commit to moving. Rob later said that he wished that he had told Jennifer he loved her in the year that they were dating. Since he hadn't, it's possible that she was questioning his commitment and it sparked an argument. In any event... Rob was the last known person to speak with Jennifer, and this is the last 
of the concrete facts for that night. Again, this call, this conversation ends around 9.57 p.m. Cheers, mates. Cheers. Now, the next morning, Tuesday, January 24th, 2006, Jennifer had an important meeting at work. This was scheduled for 11 a.m. Her typical routine was to leave for work between 7.30 and 7.45. She may have left early on that morning if she intended to stop at a FedEx to send off Travis's phone, but it is more likely that she intended to do as she said and make use of the FedEx services at work. Rob and Jennifer always spoke by phone in the mornings when they were apart. Jennifer would call him from the phone on her way to the office. Here's what Rob told Nancy Grace, quote, every day she would either call me just to say good morning, have a great day, or just text me to wish me to, you know, have a good day, love you, that type of thing. And when I didn't receive it Tuesday morning, I thought it was odd, end quote. Rob chalked Jen's being MIA up to being busy, just getting back into the swing of things after this short little vacation. Right. But after a while, he called her cell. This was before his 9 a.m. meeting at work, and he got her voicemail. He tried again a little later, but got the same result. Jennifer didn't show up for her 11 a.m. meeting. Not only was this totally out of character, it was completely unheard of. Jennifer was known for her punctuality, and if she had planned on missing work at all, she would have called in to say so. After calling her cell phone and repeatedly getting her voicemail, her boss, John Willman, had the IT department check her computer calendar, and it showed that she knew about the meeting that day and had planned on attending. It was so unusual for her to be absent without any explanation at all that her boss ended up calling Jennifer's parents. And sometimes in cases we see that people not taking action right away, and you got to applaud her boss for doing so. I, I do applaud her boss for doing so, but I do want to point out, it seems to me like, look, th- with with these very popular cases, the ones that are more well-known, right. you know, there's hundreds of thousands of eyes and ears on these things. I've noticed, though, it seems like the employers or whoever notifies whomever or does not notify anyone, they're like vilified either way. Right. Because I've seen, especially in this case, where they're like, well... After only a few hours, why are they reaching out to her parents? Um, they saying that it seems unusual. No, and I feel like, look, we, you and I, and all these other people that are questioning this behavior, they do not know Jennifer Kessie. Mm-hmm. They do not know the relationship between her and her employer and the people she worked with, the coworkers. We don't know that. We're going off of reports, so. I bring that up only because I don't find it to be strange. And I think that it might, given this situation and what we're told about Jennifer and and about this company and her coworkers, it might be more strange that they didn't call anybody. And and keep in mind, this is after repeated attempts of trying to reach Jennifer herself. Right. And I think if I was working with people in general and opposed to animals, as opposed to you, you (laughs) filthy animal. Or, or even, you know, if we're supposed to get together to record in the garage and you didn't show up and you didn't call and then I called you and it went right to voicemail multiple times, I'd try to get a hold of somebody in your family. Well, some reports say that this call to the parents was either because Joyce Kessie was listed as Jen's emergency contact 
And some say it was because John Willman was a friend of Drew Kessie's. Either way, Jennifer's parents were notified that she had not shown up for work or for this meeting. Right. And this was reason enough for them to go into panic mode. Joyce Kessie was at a Kinko's at the time, copying materials for her work presentation that day. When she got the call, she walked out immediately, leaving everything behind to be shredded. Jennifer's parents called both her cell phone and her home phone, and of course, we know that they're receiving no answers. Her cell phone went directly to voicemail. Drew Kessie told Nancy Grace that this was the first time in eight years that Jen had a cell phone that she did not answer his call. Right. Drew was stuck at home waiting for Travis to get back from the gym with Drew's car. Travis hadn't taken his phone, and Drew didn't know the name of the gym. So Drew made some phone calls, first to the Orlando Police Department then to the property manager at Mosaic at Millennia. The property manager reported that Jennifer's car was not in its parking spot. At the Kessie's request, he knocked on Jen's door and then opened it and looked around and said he didn't see anything unusual. When he reported this, the Kessies became very alarmed. Drew and Joyce and Logan and their friend Travis and two separate cars set out for Orlando, which would be a two-hour drive. On the way, Joyce called Rob and some of Jennifer's friends, who had not heard from her either. And she also called hospitals in the area, thinking perhaps Jennifer was in an accident. Well, think about what her brother's going through at this moment, too. You're really close with your sister, and your dad is saying, Hey, look, we're going to be taking a drive because your sister's missing. That'd be frightening stuff. Right. And he had just stayed there at her place that weekend. Right. Travis and Logan arrived at Mosaic at Millennia around 3 p.m. And the Kessies arrived around 3.15. Rob also arrived on the scene. They convened in Jennifer's condo where this is what they found. Okay. They found the door was locked when they arrived. It was also reported to be locked when the complex manager checked on it. Right. From what I can gather, one needs a key to lock the door from the outside. So either Jen locked it or someone used her key to do so. Right. But just to be clear, I'm assuming her parents had a key. I don't know if her parents had a key. I think they may have, but we do know that Logan had a key right. because she, he right. stayed there that last weekend. The lights were off. Jennifer's bed was unmade. Now laid out on the bed were two work outfits in the tan and black color scheme. Mm -hmm. Her new Nine West alligator pumps were missing. This is interesting and this is this could be key here. This is a pair of shoes that her mother was well aware of. These are shoes that they had discussed on the phone many times. Remember, Joyce and Jennifer have a daily phone call. Her luggage from her trip was still in the hallway. Remember, it's still packed at this time. She had not unpacked her luggage from that short weekend trip. Her mail was on the counter, and some of the junk mail was in the trash, mm -hmm. which was otherwise empty other than this junk mail. There was no evidence that Jen had ate anything for dinner. It was not obvious that that took place. But we would later learn that she had not used her credit or debit cards and there were no containers or dishes lying about. Mm -hmm. The clothes she wore to work on Monday were hanging over the back of a chair. Her t-shirt and underwear, which her family says she normally wore this type of thing to bed, they were on the bathroom floor. And her contact case was empty and they found her glasses, I'm, I'm assuming, on the bathroom counter. Yes, they were on the bathroom sink counter and the contact lenses case was found to be empty. Her makeup and hair dryer were on the bathroom sink as well. And, you know, it's thought that where these items were left, that someone had possibly recently used them or used them that morning. Mm -hmm. In the shower, there were still puddles of water. This is in the corner shelf areas surrounding the shampoo and cleanser bottles. Mm -hmm. 
There was a damp towel draped over the washing machine in the laundry room. A portable can of pepper spray was on the kitchen counter. Remember, we discussed earlier that she carried pepper spray on her keychain. This was purchased for her by her father. But he is guessing that Jennifer had to leave it at home since she could not bring it on the airplane on the flight to St. Croix. Right, that would make sense. Take it off the keychain, and for whatever reason, it's still sitting there, which is it has got to be driving the parents nuts. She's missing. They're checking out her apartment. Pepper spray on the countertop. The evidence we have right now, you can go, well, she, she talked to her boyfriend at night. She probably slept in her bed. It seems like then she woke up. She got ready for work. We have the puddles in the shower. We got the wet towel. It seems as if everything would add up that she left the apartment. My mind would immediately go to, and this makes sense as to why Joyce called the the area hospitals. Mm -hmm. With her car not being there and the appearance that she got ready for work and probably kept to her routine, Mm -hmm. my mind would immediately go to either we're just missing something here and she arrived incredibly late at work for some reason, or she was involved in a vehicle accident on her way to work and we can't find her or get a hold of her. That's where my mind would go to in that that instance. Well, again, this is why I think people need to jump into action because let's say it was some thing where Jennifer was going to work and her, her phone was messed up and she decided to stop and get a new phone before she got to work and she was running late so she couldn't call um, because let's say the phone stopped working on the way to work or whatever. That eventually you're going to find her safe and you're going to go, well, maybe we overreacted, but it's better than to underact. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, the, there was a bottle of rum that apparently Jennifer told her father she had purchased for him in St. Croix. Mm-hmm. They find this That's a sitting good daughter. on yeah. the counter and the condo directly across from Jennifer's was found to be unlocked. Logan, her brother, found this and went inside and he said that it was empty and found that the condo unit had no carpeting. According to her parents, Drew and Joyce, Jennifer was a morning shower person. She always showered before work and never showered in the evening. So after seeing what we just said, they observed in the condo, they came to the conclusion that Jennifer probably woke up for work on the morning of the 24th showered as usual, got ready for work. We talk about what was there at the condo, what they found in the condo, but let's talk about what was missing because what's missing from the condo clinched this belief for them that she got up, performed her normal morning routine, and then something happened. Here's what was missing. Travis's Nextel cell phone, which Jennifer had told Logan she would FedEx from work the next day. Jennifer's cell phone, this is a Verizon LG flip phone, Jennifer's purse, which included her driver's license, her iPod, which apparently she took this with her everywhere, her car keys, their car keys are on the same ring as her house key and her mail key. Jennifer's briefcase was also missing, which is often left in her car or even in her car trunk, sometimes overnight. This is according to her friends. And her car is missing. This is a Chevy Malibu. Right. And I would bet that everyone is kind of thinking the same thing here. Everything that was missing, Jennifer would have taken with her to work that day. But as we know, she never made it there. So what the hell happened? Yeah, what happened and when did it happen? Yeah, and that's really a big piece of this case, I believe. it's. I mean, it's a huge missing puzzle piece. Really what we have here, Captain, is we have a 9.57 p.m. phone call that ends, and we have an 11 a.m. meeting that she was scheduled to attend. That meeting seems to set off all these alarm bells that she is not where she is supposed to be right? and that there's something going on. So that gives us a 13-hour window of time when something went wrong. Now- 
Right, but we can start assuming with the evidence that she slept in her bed and she woke up at some point and she was heading to work. Possibly. The other thing you can do here is instead of working with the 13-hour window of time, we can assume that maybe we could minus three hours or so off of that because her regular time to arrive at work would be roughly 8 a.m. Right. So, you know, now we're working with a 10-hour window. And yeah, but don't you think the evidence in her condo suggests that she, one, slept there, and then two, got ready for work? Yes, I lean. I certainly lean that way. There are plenty of people that make good, strong arguments for something could have happened late that night. Mm -hmm. And I think it's worth examining, but I'm with you. I feel like the evidence that we see points to everything was normal up until the time she was supposed to leave for work or just before. Yeah, and I think maybe he, it's a, I don't know if they did this, but can you just test the towel and if it's her DNA and then you would start assuming again that she took a shower in the morning and not at, at 10 PM. I can say that was not done. Right. So we just don't know. Now is probably a good time to discuss Jennifer's parents, Drew and Joyce Cassie. It's safe to say they were not the typical powerless family members of victims that sometimes we see in these cases who have no choice but to put their faith in law enforcement and wait patiently for answers. As far as the Kessies are concerned, Jennifer's disappearance, understandably so, was an unmitigated disaster, and they were not going to take it lying down. They immediately became activists, outspoken advocates, outspoken advocates for their daughter's case. As Drew told a CNN reporter in 2009, quote, we both have big mouths. We know how to use them, and we will do everything within our power to give her the best chance of being found. Drew and Joyce are both smart, articulate, motivated, and in Drew's case, somewhat intense people. Being realistic about why people abduct women, Drew said they abduct them to rape them and kill them. They sprang into action immediately. Yeah, I mean, one of he's one of the things I heard him say was they don't kidnap a, a female to just put her in the corner and look at her. Yeah, yeah. But at least he's being real. At least he's being honest. And I think that's also a cry out to the public. If somebody took her, the chances are the, the reasons they took her are for very bad reasons. Yeah, and, and, and that's... And, and this needs to be some. This needs to be important. Right, and it's in, it's important that he remind the public of what the likely actions were by the offender because somebody right. may have knowledge. There's just no victim's name attached to that knowledge. Sometimes people brag or tell stories, and they tell of their actions, but they don't say who they did that to. Right. And this is a case where we need help from the public. The Kessies immediately dropped everything in their lives, this is an interesting move, but I think it shows the level of their commitment to finding their daughter, finding out what happened to their daughter, and their intelligence as well. They moved into Jennifer's condo. They actually lived there full time for several months while they pushed law enforcement to find their girl. This is good for many reasons. I really believe that the, the condo complex is at the center of this whole case. So if there was any knowledge to learn about that condo complex or who may be going in and out of there, mm -hmm. one could gain that knowledge by living there, by being there after hours, being there on the weekends, so on and so forth. But on top of that, they live in Tampa. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a mess to try to keep law enforcement on top of their daughter's case and be two hours away. From 2006 until the present day, they have been constant, a constant thorn in the side of the Orlando Police Department. They hired private investigators. They put flyers everywhere. They held press conferences. They got Jennifer's face on the sides of buses in Orlando. They handed out playing cards with Jennifer's face to prisoners to try to drum up tips. And it wasn't just her face. They ended up taking a, a bunch of different missing people. 
and putting them on the cards. That shows the level of their j- just the goodness in their hearts. Well, yeah, they're they're trying they're to help f- their daughter's case and other missing persons' cases, right? But also the sophistication that their brains can think. Hey, we we, we have heard that sometimes by this is a tactic that people use, and then why prisoners are playing with the cards somebody comes out and says hey i know this person Mm -hmm. drew even got mic'd up and went into death row to meet with a prisoner who claimed he had information Mm -hmm. sadly it turns out this was just a hoax well was this the guy that um he, he he was on death row but he claimed to know things about a lot of different cases and and I think this is the guy that they said, if he brings up whoever, mm-hmm. that you'll know right away that it's uh, the whole story is bullshit. He had nothing to do with it, or, or has no knowledge. Right, but of think such. again. Put your brain into the the mind of the the father. You have this beautiful daughter; she's gone missing. You have no answers. Hey, there's this guy on death row. He might know something. You know, this guy is a bad mamma jamma right and you have to get mic'd up and go into a room with them and then knowing if he brings up so and so that the whole story is bullshit and so you're hopeful that you get some kind of information or some kind of lead and you're sitting across the table from this creepo and then he brings up that name and then it'd be want to talk about a roller coaster of emotions the whole time and it's been going on for many years They set up a Facebook page or Facebook pages and established the jenniferkessie.com website, which is still very active today. If anybody wants to look that up, it's it's Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, Kessie is K-E-S-S-E.com. They contacted every consulate in the United Nations. As a result, Jen is listed as missing on Interpol and VICAP. The Kessies documented everything they came across in their search for their daughter, and they participated in countless TV specials, news stories, and podcasts to raise awareness of their daughter's disappearance. Eventually, the Kessies would be forced to sue the Orlando Police Department. Before we get too far along, Captain, I want to make sure that we do our due diligence here. We have to give credit for much of the information, the good information anyway, in this case. This is due to some of the sources we have already mentioned, but a big garage cheers has to go out to the podcast Unconcluded. So to Sean and Scott over at Unconcluded, cheers mates. We have relied heavily on the Unconcluded podcast and the Help Find Jennifer Kessie Facebook page, which discusses the case and maintains a database of timelines and facts. Of course, we recommend both. By late afternoon, on the day that Jennifer was discovered to be missing, the Kessies had already printed off hundreds of flyers with Jennifer's picture and a photo of her car and the license plate number. They, Rob, Lauren, and 12 of Jen's sorority sisters, stood on street corners, near her condo, and handed out these flyers to rush hour drivers. They also posted flyers all over the area, including at her condo complex. The Kessies, of course, had called the Orlando police, and they met with detectives Gauze and Wright at the condo that evening, along with Rob, Travis, and Logan. I do want to point out here, though, that Detective Wright was almost immediately replaced by Detective Browning. So for anybody looking into this case, just be aware of that. Drew and Joyce were not really impressed by the detectives and with this meeting. Although they took the report, the missing persons report, and said they would look into the case, Mm -hmm. Drew and Joyce said that the Orlando Police Department's opinion was that Jennifer simply took off after a fight with her boyfriend, and eventually she would turn up. Yeah. That's what we're told almost every time, right, Captain? Yeah, it's a bunch of lazy people. So, of course, the Kessies flat out refused to believe this. They were incensed at the implications. There was no way that Jennifer had left, 
she loved her life. Drew and Joyce vowed to find their daughter no matter what it took, but there was very little to go on. The Orlando Police Department issued a be on the lookout for Jennifer and her vehicle. This went out around 9 p.m. that evening. The Orlando police spent 13 years investigating Jennifer's case. And Captain, you are more than well aware of this because of your work on the Tyler Davis case. But I found this to be just an interesting little stat. Over 3,000 missing persons reports are filed annually in Orange County, Florida. During that time, the detectives initially assigned to the case retired a year into the investigation, and new detectives came and took over the investigation. They, too, left, and new ones were assigned. This is a 13-year old investigation. I'm not faulting Orlando Police Department for assigning new detectives. We, when we have people retire, that's what has to happen. Right. It's a 13 year investigation, right? You can't force them to stay on the force. So a lot of work was done. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say there's a episode of disappeared. It's called girl interrupted. It aired in 2016. Um, and they had some detectives. I, I don't know which detectives they were right, but they had some detectives on that show talking about the case again. They they make the claim, hey, well, we know that she got in an argument with the boyfriend, so maybe she just took off. Very unimpressed with these detectives. The thing here is too, with the switching of detectives. So the new detectives are only left with what the old ones provide them with, right? And there was a lot of work done in this case, and the files number tens of thousands of pages. One thing that was obvious to be a problem and extremely unfortunate was that the original detectives were old school. Mm -hmm. They didn't use computers. Right. They didn't really even take any notes. Mm -hmm. So when they were retiring and moving on, put out the pasture, uh, and the new detectives come in, they're left with, with almost nothing. And I think that they were that the original detectives were forced or at least asked and did so like write down everything you can remember about the case before you you're, you're done and you're out of here. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Right. That basically says, yeah, we know your daughter went missing, but we don't give a fuck. I'll tell you what, man, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you, I don't watch the show anymore, but remember the, like the first 48 and then there's, I think mm. there's another show that's the 72 hours, whatever. Mm. Anyway, I'm talking about these, these cases where you, you can watch a unit, homicide detective, robbery detective, whomever, and they're interviewing people and they're, I cannot tell you how many times that I've seen what I call like old school detective work, work in a case. Right. And I love it. Like that's one of my favorite things. These are guys and, and, and women that are interviewing people and taking down notes. They're writing things down, even shit that doesn't seem important at the time. They write it down mm. and multiple times. There's something that happens a week later or some vehicle is spotted elsewhere a week later and they can flip back through their notes and go, oh yeah, I remember. I thought I remembered something like that. I wrote down a blue Lincoln was spotted here. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now they've got the lead that they needed. So I get that not everybody was raised around computers and to use them. Mm -hmm. I Did don't understand this in computer school. I don't uh, understand the fact that they, it's been reported that these guys didn't even take notes. That seems to me to be the most basic and simplistic portion of detective work and, and recording your work along the way. Yeah, you wonder if that's bullshit or if they took some notes and, and the department can't find them. I mean, you start by the obvious. We have this girl that went missing. Let's try to figure out, did she stay there that night? Roughly what time do we think this happened? Is there any eyewitness that saw her car there at night? Start there. Now we go to the boyfriend. Now we go to the ex-boyfriend. Now we go to anybody else that maybe she had any romantic ties to. Now let's go to the family. And and at the same time, then you go to every staff member and that condo complex. And then you go to the different staff members 
of the construction. But that lies a big problem. When you don't have a list of those workers, uh, now you have any of those workers plus any of their immediate contacts that possibly worked with them at some point. So now the pool is becoming so big to try to investigate. Well, and anyone that's experienced one of these renovation, the large scale renovations or construction projects on, on housing sites and residential areas, and even in commercial areas, mm-hmm. understands that it's not as easy as just going to one big company and going, give me a list of all the workers that are working on this property. It doesn't work that way because there's multiple, multiple companies, some of them big, some of them small, some of them one man owner operated operations properties. So right, right, because it gets they to can be hi- difficult. Right, because they could hire one contractor that is only there to do tile one contractor that's only there to do drywall. The problem is, is when you're able to contact that contractor and they're not going to give you the proper names of the people that work for them because they're undocumented. That becomes an issue. That becomes a safety issue for others. And yeah. and that's where, yeah, maybe I cannot be so impressed with these detectives from this TV series or maybe not impressed with some of the rumors that I heard but the stacks, uh, you know, but the cards are stacked up against these detectives, anyways. Especially the newer ones, because they're left with very little information from the original detective. Detective. So, for mm-hmm. whatever reason, or however you want to slice it, much about the early months of this investigation is lost or unknown. There is virtually nothing in the case file from the first sixteen months of the investigation. We do know that the following was done or was not done by the Orlando Police Department. Jennifer's condo was never processed. The handrails on the two sets of stairs leading from Jennifer's floor, the second floor, to street level were not dusted for prints. Jennifer's credit cards were checked. There was no activity after the abduction. The Orlando Police Department has never commented on her bank records or phone records. The Orlando PD checked closed circuit TV and traffic cameras near all relevant locations. Jen's condo did not have surveillance cameras at that time. The Orlando Police Department checked pawn shops in the area. They also took Jennifer's laptop into evidence. The police visited Jennifer's workplace about a week after she went missing and did some cursory interviews with her colleagues and took her work computer into evidence as well. The Orlando police ordered a ping study to try to see where Jennifer's cell phone was on January 23rd and 24th. The discussion of the pings and Jennifer's phone is probably one of the most debated and confusing pieces about Jennifer's case. Drew Kessy addressed the pings in the, in an episode on unconcluded and in one entry in the guest book on the family's website as well. And we will revisit this issue further a little later for now. Remember the Kessies said that Jennifer had terrible cell service in her condo. In addition They have said that one of the cell towers near the mosaic at millennia was damaged or down at the time, implying that Jen's phone had to ping off a further away tower. When the Orlando police department looked at 11 pings related to Jennifer's phone, according to drew and Joyce, the police believed that Jennifer was out and about late on the night of Monday, the 23rd moving away from her condo after her 9.57 p.m. conversation with Rob. Further, they believed that she had gone to a shady area of town. It's not known where this was. The Kessies absolutely denied that there was any way Jennifer would go out that late on a work night after getting up at 5 a.m. that day. And they said once she was in for the night and in her sweats and glasses, she would never have redressed and gone back out. The Orlando Police Department detectives said to the Kessies, quote, 
You don't know your daughter as well as you think you do. One more thing that the Orlando Police Department seems to have told the Kessies was that both Jennifer's phone and Travis's phone were powered off at some point that night, around 10.40 p.m. But the Kessies knew that Jennifer used her phone as an alarm clock and didn't turn it off that night. want to thank everybody for listening and thank you for telling a friend make sure you go to truecrimegarage.com check out our store page we still have our pre-sale going on that's a zodiac zip up and a true crime garage brewing company pullover sweatshirt make sure you check that out today we'll see you back here in the garage tomorrow until then be good be kind and don't litter